let me welcome you to the S.J. Quinney College of Law. Uh, I'm Bob Keiter. I have the uh, privilege uh, not only of uh, uh, introducing uh, our topic and moderator today, but also of serving as the uh, acting dean for the College of Law this semester while our colleague Bob Adler is on uh, sabbatical. And uh, in that capacity, I'm uh, just uh, as pleased as I can be both to uh, welcome uh, all of you uh, to this event uh, and uh, to the uh, 34th uh, annual uh, Martin Luther King uh, Week uh, here at the uh, University of Utah. Uh, the Martin Luther King Week has become a platform uh, at the university to engage uh, students, faculty, staff, and community members in critical conversations around contemporary civil rights issues and race relations in America. Uh, this uh, opportunity for us here at the College of Law uh, to uh, partner with uh, the university's Office for Equity and Diversity is also uh, a real uh, privilege for us. It's the first time that we've done this, uh, that is uh, entered into this partnership, but the College of Law seems like an appropriate forum uh, to host this conversation on environmental uh, racism. Uh, among other things, uh, the College of Law uh, is uh, a lead a certified a platinum uh, building. Uh, we are uh, committed here to principles of sustainability. Uh, we are the second uh, law school in the United States to achieve the LEED platinum status. Uh, the College of Law also hosts the Wallace Stegner Center for Land Resources and the Environment, uh, a reflection uh, of uh, the college's commitment to uh, environmental uh, issues as well as uh, social justice uh, issues. And I should also mention that the law school's environmental law program is ranked uh, within the top 10 uh, environmental law programs across uh, the country. Um, the uh, uh, connection uh, of the law school to Martin Luther King, uh, I think, uh, is evident uh, right here uh, in uh, the courtroom. Uh, if you'll look to your right, uh, you will notice uh, that uh, we have graced uh, this courtroom with a memorable quotation from Dr. King. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Uh, and that uh, too seems uh, appropriate uh, to remember as we address uh, this uh, topic uh, today. Um, <clears throat> the uh, theme uh, this year, uh, of the uh, Martin Luther King uh, event, uh, Toxic, a Conversation on Environmental Racism, uh, addresses the ongoing problem of environmental racism as reflected in the systems uh, and policies that disproportionately uh, regulate zoning laws, chemical and toxic waste, and the access to natural resources for uh, communities of color as a way that uh, ends up uh, furthering uh, the inequity of social, economic, and political power within our society. And I expect uh, our speakers to be addressing uh, these topics. Uh, to handle uh, the conversation today, uh, we're pleased to have with us Dr. Evie uh, Garcia, uh, who will moderate uh, the conversation. Uh, I should note at the outset that unfortunately uh, one of the today's speakers, uh, Dr. Robert uh, Bullard, uh, is not able to be with us uh, due to the uh, extraordinarily unlikely occurrence of an ice storm uh, in Houston uh, that disrupted his uh, ability <laughs> to travel here. Uh, how often does that happen? But uh, nonetheless, uh, we're still in good hands. Uh, Dr. Uh, Garcia is an assistant professor in city and metropolitan in planning uh, and here at the university, uh, and she's also vice chair of the planning commission in Salt Lake City uh, at uh, the uh, city and metropolitan planning uh, department. She works in close collaboration with uh, the university neighborhood partners, and she's also affiliated with the Metropolitan Research uh, Center. Uh, she has a long history of working with uh, diverse communities throughout uh, the country. 
Uh, and uh, specifically, she's been engaged in facilitating the integration of uh, racial and ethnic groups into uh, the democratic planning uh, processes. Uh, her most recent uh, studies uh, have analyzed existing as well as historic relationships um, <clears throat> uh, between uh, uh, market typologies, the structured dynamics of housing stratification and distribution and community development strategies in diverse communities, uh, primarily uh, Latino communities. The work that she does has implications that reach to the problems of uneven development, the role of the state in the formation and maintenance of market economies, grassroots organizing, and housing policy more generally. Uh, she will introduce our speakers, and let me turn the program over to Dr. Garcia. Well, thank, thank you, you again so for joining us. Uh, thanks, Paul, uh, Tyler, for such a kind um, introduction. So I'm like, I'm really glad to be sitting here with two um, advocates and um, two people who have like done um, great and amazing things to advance environmental justice um, nationally, but also calling attention to um, internationally about the, some of the issues that we have here um, in the in the United States. Um, and hopefully, we will be able to talk about different scales in terms of like what we can do nationally, internationally, and, and here um, locally as well. Um, so in terms of like the way that this is going to work, we are going to, I'm going to introduce the speakers and then we are going to have about um, five questions. Um, and then we are going to have some opportunity for people to engage in, in a conversation. But we are going to do this in a very uh, different manner. So it's gonna be digitally and people um, later on will show some code in where with your phones you can actually put your comments and um, if you uh, like the question that somebody asks, you start the question and democratically it will rise <laughs> and then we will um, ask that question. Um, so, uh, and then later on we have some closing um, statements for, uh, for the speakers. Um, so I'm just going to uh, introduce um, each one of them. Uh, Tara Hauschka, um, she's a tribal rights attorney and a water um, protector. Um, I love that phrase, she's a water protector. Um, Tara Hauska, she is um, actually from the Kaushishin First Nation, and she is the National Campaigns Director uh, for Honor the Earth, which is a native lead organization that creates awareness and supports uh, for native environmental issues and develops needed financial and political resources for the survival um, of sustainable native um, communities. And I will add to that to the self-determination of like native communities as well. Um, during Bernie, Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign, uh, Hauska served as an advisor for Native American uh, policy. And Hauska has also been active in countering the Dakota Access Pipeline and assisting those who now face legal backlash due to their participation in their protest. And we will be hearing um, about that. For Hauschka, um, matters such, such environmental health and safety are of the almost urgent issues that the native community faces. Uh, Outside Magazine describes Hauschka's work as embodying the notion that we can't treat environmental and social injustice um, separately. These issues indicate race, economic disparity, and income inequality. And that actually would be one of the first questions, how this interrelates between just uh, having, uh, thinking about socioeconomics and thinking about um, race and what are those relationships. Uh, House cafes, um, you don't see a pipeline going through Beverly Hills. Keeping that issue of justice at the forefront is really important to me in everything that I do. In August, uh, Hashka was selected as one of the recipients of house, Good Housekeeping 2017 Awesome Women. Random. Yes, no, it's a, that's a cool name. Awesome Women Award <laughs> for her work um, in bringing Native Americans to the national conversation. Um, and 
Something I, I wanted to add is um, that, again, Nat Native Americans are uh, people of color, but of the people of color, sometimes we forget Native Americans, right? So we will be hearing about that as well. Uh, furthermore, uh, Haska is an advocate for Native participation in government as a means to create change. Uh, she told Australian news outlet SBS, whether it's voting, outreach to your representatives, serving in government, or running for political office, our rights are best represented and advocated by, uh, for by our own people. So let's uh, welcome Tara Harshka. Uh, and now I'm going to introduce uh, Najira Sharif. She's a grassroots organizer based in Flint, Michigan. Uh, she is a co-founder of the Flint Democracy Defense League, which is a grassroots group formed to conform, uh, confront, not conform, confront, of course, uh, Flint's emergency uh, manager in 2011. Um, she is also the executive director for Flint Rising, which is a coalition of Flint residents and community groups, labor and progressive um, allies. Sharif became heavily involved in the issue of the emergency manager, which led to contaminated water because the city was um, not only unresponsive to complaints from residents during public hearings, but it was also telling people that the water was safe um, to use. Um, so today we will be talking a little bit about um, <laughs> the news, right, and, and politics and what is being told um, to, to communities. And the question of is this intentional, we want to address a little bit um, of that. Uh, Sharif told the news, there is a desire to balance the books by any means necessary, human life um, be them. If we uh, where in an all-white city will it have taken over a year to declare a state of emergency? And I can definitely relate to that. Um, I'm from Puerto Rico, so would it take this long <laughs> to have an electricity um, and uh, power and all the things that we, we needed? And it, how this relates to environmental justice, the lack of response from, from government. Um, she asked, uh, this is telling of a larger conversation of disinvestment from black and brown communities. In October 2017, um, Lifetime released the movie Flint, which describes the crisis in this city and features several of the women leading the movement. Of course, Sharif um, was included. She has also been featured on Democracy Now. I should add that also Tara Hoshka was featured in Democracy Now. So all these ladies are um, uh, out there informing us of these important issues. Um, and she uh, moved to amend Posca's um, uh, Al Sajira and uh, Nitrous Nation speaking out about problems with flint water and with Michigan emergency management of um, local governments. So let's uh, welcome Nayar Yesh Charit. So first we're going to do an introduction because I read these, but of course you have your things to say about yourself. Um, but also because this conversation is like with, um, with students, um, that are looking the, the, the path towards creating their, their professional um, careers, but also being involved in their communities and making difference um, in this world. Um, I wanted to ask if you can introduce yourself, but also how did you become interested in this, in this work? And maybe we can just start with um, Tara. Sure. Uh, Buju. Tara Indigena Kajaganashi Mangminua Jabuwekwe Indigena Kazanishnabemang. Uh, my name is Tara. I'm Bear Clan from Kuching First Nation. Um, so I, I was actually I went through the law school process not too long ago, really. Uh, I graduated in 2012 from the University of Minnesota. Um, I focused heavily on patent law. Had no idea I would end up sitting in a room like this. 
um, and did a uh, Master's of Law at ASU in 2013. May or may not still owe a thesis for that, but um, <laughs> yeah. And then went into private practice in, in Washington, D.C., um, and was a tribal lobbyist and attorney for nations across, across the United States. And at the same time, I was kind of confronted with this, you know, at first it was the Washington football team. Um, so, you know, seeing these headdresses and caricatures of Native people in the, in the nation's capital. Um, I was from Minnesota. We'd never had something like that. You know, was, we banned Native mascots back in 1992. Um, so I ended up being in this weird position of working for a law firm and then going and organizing protests and all that stuff on the side, like in my spare time. Um, and Keystone XL was also really raging at that time. And it was something that I had worked on when I was an intern at the White House Council on Environmental Quality. And that was in 2011, and it was like then 2014 still happening. Um, and so I was kind of, you know, <laughs> working as a full-time associate and then uh, spending my lunch breaks going over to the White House and like yelling in my suit and then running back to work on billable hours. Um, and so, yeah, I just ended up being kind of recruited by Winona LaDuke, who runs Honor the Earth. And she was just like, are you ready? Are you going to come work for me? Come on, it'll be great. <laughs> um, and so now I'm in, in that world, and that was kind of my path towards where I am today, which is advocating on the front lines and also using my legal background to work in the regulatory process, in the legal process and legislative process, um, and try my best not to get arrested while I'm doing it. I think that's it. <laughs> You're right. Awesome. Just hit the button. Oh, great. Yay. Green means on. Um, <laughs> Salaam alaikum. Nair Sharif. Um, I'm from Flint, Michigan. And um, the birthplace of General Motors, by the way. And uh, the home of the Flint sit down strike, which um, over 80 years ago. You had a group of workers that occupied a, a General Motors plant for 45 days, and that's really how the UAW like came to be because you had folks that like basically occupied public, like private property, which it's never legal to occupy private property, but um, that's what happened. And how I got into this work is I will say super timey whiny. Like I worked as a software engineer, and then decided that I didn't want to do that anymore because I felt like it was like very misogynistic and being like a young black woman it was like kind of icky, even though like I made tons of money and got to travel all around the world, but that's not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And then um, ended up becoming a community organizer and going into public health and like working on like health promotion programs and then in 2011, um, Michigan passed the emergency manager law, which you had um, a state law, which is like one of these state receivership laws. And uh, because of debt, financial debt, um, the state has the power to take over like local government and replace two branches of your local government for a school district. That's your school board and superintendent and for a municipality that's the mayor, city council, or county executive and board of commissioners. And they had the power to sell off private assets, uh, renegotiate union contracts, initiate bankruptcy proceedings, and to pass ordinances, all without the, um, the input or the vote of people or unions like on, on the pretense of balancing the budget. So this is like one of the first times in the history of the United States where you had the loss of local democracy based on financial debt. And um, when that happened, we were like, hell no, that's like proto-fascism and we don't, we, don't, we don't really want that. And, um, but the application of that was really in communities of color. There hasn't been a poor white community yet or a rich white community yet within the state of Michigan that has had their um, democracy stolen from them. And at one point in time, 51% of the African American population in the state of Michigan lived in a community where they did not have like local democracy 
and 75% of the local black local um, elected officials within the state had their powers stolen from them. And that's really one of the driving motivators of the Flint water crisis because if we didn't have, if we had actual local control of the city, then we wouldn't have made, they wouldn't have switched over to the Flint River, which has been a historic dumping ground for General Motors and DuPont. And you wouldn't have had um, people who were going out and really demonstrating what was happening in their water, there would have been a response from local communities. Um, and and I live in Flint, so like this was like this wasn't just some stuff where I'm just like, oh, it's happening, and I'm not impacted, and I'm not affected by it. Like no, it was happening in my house. My water was coming out looking like straight up chicken broth. Didn't taste like chicken broth. Um, really smelled like an open sewer. And unfortunately, you have a community of over 100,000 people that have like long-term unknown health impacts um, based on this um, long-term exposure. I think that both of you already started to define what is um, environmental racism by talking about your experiences. Um, but yesterday I was talking to Nidan Chand, who is from the Office of Equity and Diversity, and she said it might be useful to define what environmental racism um, means. And um, we're going to do a little exercise because many, so many of you probably have taken classes where you talked a lot about environmental racism and you can come with a definition, right? But some of you might be like, I kind of know what it is, but uh, not not so sure, and I can learn more. So I'm wondering if we can just like raise your hand if you think you know you know what it is, and other people kind of like more in the middle here with your hands not so high <laughs> for or very high for environmental racism. You think that you can define environmental racism? All right. Um, so we are going to hear um, what environmental racism means, right? And part of the question here is like how we get at the idea that you have like class, right, and socioeconomics, and how this relates um, to race. So I'm going to ask like a few uh, sub questions of, of that, so you, we can define what environmental um, racism is. Um, do minority com or uh, people of color? Um, and individuals or also uh, communities face higher levels of environmental risk than the majority uh, population. Is this increased risk the result of environmental racism, environmental inequity, and environmental injustice? Is race a determining factor in assessing exposure to environmental risk and this important question, like, is this um, exposure um, deliberate, right? And in other words, can we divorce um, race from, from this um, equation? My and first. here, you, any of okay. you can um, start. And also integrate, you know, build into, into answers. Okay. First. okay. <laughs> um, first, I'm going to do a lawyer thing and, and add an addendum onto my introduction. <laughs> um, so actually, before I moved to DC, um, why I moved away from patent law, I don't know if anyone's in patent law. Is anyone doing patent law or intellectual property? Or is it all mostly environmental? Okay. Um, the reason why I ended up moving away from that was because I took a law clinic when I was in my second year and did it my third year, it was the Indian Child Welfare um, Law Clinic at the University of Minnesota, and it completely changed my career path and where I was going to go. Um, you know, there's kind of like this, how did you become an activist? You know, why, are, why this issue, why this area? I think when you're an indigenous person in North America, you don't really have much of a choice. Um, it's just what issue are you going to focus on? Because there are so many. It can be, you know, health, it can be environment, it can be something like your children being taken away from you. It can be, uh, you know, the violence against women that's an insane, insanely high proportion in this country. Um, there's just so many different avenues, and so the environment was one that I felt was at the core of so much of it. Um, you know, this, this violence against women is perpetuated in violence against the earth. 
um, the, the, the creation of pipelines and infrastructure projects are things that then result in man camps. Man camps of thousands of workers coming in and then increasing crime, increasing violent crime against uh, the people in those areas, which often happen to be Indian reservations. Um, what your question is, is about, you know, if you take race out of the equation, I think, yeah, you know, there's this argument of a lot of people that this is just about economics. You know, this is about an economic argument of this is a really rich neighborhood and they have the power, they have the political power, they have the political capital to avoid something like this. But then you look at something like, okay, I think the example where it was most apparent or at least like on the very face of it, it was so obvious was um, when I was in North Dakota fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline, part of the reason why we were out there was Okay, so they had this project that they allegedly had to send out of the Bakken, right? They had to send this project out of the Bakken, um, which is rife with so many violent issues against the Native communities in that area already. And so you know what's going to happen. You know, you know what's coming that way. People ask, why are you involved? I already knew, and so did lots of Indian people around the country, what happens when these projects happen. Um, they had decided that they were going to route it right above Bismarck, North Dakota, this little town. White town mostly is like 90, 98 point something percent white. And because of concerns to the drinking water, they rerouted the pipeline just north of the reservation that was south of Bismarck. So it was concerning for those citizens of their drinking water, but the Indian reservation, well, they can handle it. You know, it's, it's not really our problem, it's their problem because they, their lives don't matter as much as ours. Their community doesn't matter as much as ours. Um, you know, and then you saw like the response of the, the CEO of Energy Transfer Partners, who was read off this question. He refused to debate me like back to back, right? He wouldn't let me actually. He wouldn't actually speak with me. But they read this to him. They're like, "This is environmental racism. You rerouted it from this white community. You put it next to the Indian reservation. Why would you do that? That's that's environmental racism." And he laughed and said, "That's well, that's just stupid." <laughs> Because that's somehow an argument, right? Like, can you imagine sitting in a courtroom and saying, well, Your Honor, that's stupid. No, that's not going to work out. You know, you have to have something behind it. Um, but it was so blatant. You know, it, was, it wasn't just an issue of economics. It wasn't just the Indian reservation is poorer than you. It is our people matter more than yours. Um, you know, our, our living style matters more than yours. And it's not just an Indian reservation. It's 17 million people living along the Missouri River. Um, you know, divorcing everything out of it, just as people, we need water. So, yeah, I don't really, I don't really think there's a way to, to justify that it's just strict economics. Thank you. Well, Flint is the birthplace of General Motors, if y'all didn't know. Now you have a little factoid. And, um, and Flint's in the north, so, you know, traditionally, like, people think, like, oh, the north is just, like, not racist. And the South's extremely racist, but it's like a different form of racism, like up in the North. So I remember, like my dad, like worked in General Motors, and um, and they used to have a foundry that was like there, and only black people worked in the foundry. They couldn't work anywhere else, and like that was the the most dangerous. Like people had like lung cancer. It was like spewing out like all of this horrible toxic plumes, and the people who lived in, around the factory because we had de facto segregation in the city of Flint until 1968 when Flint became the first community in the United States to pass an open housing ordinance through proper vote. Um, like all the black people and some white immigrants like lived right around the factories. And then, like, once you had, like, expansion, you had, like, former toxic dumps that were developed into housing, and the city of Flint made the decision, like, we'll just, instead of cleaning it up, we'll just, like, take the fine, and you just go live in that house. And um, then you had, um, like, long before the water crisis, you had, like, all this air pollution because, like, the the state of Michigan failed to do environmental impact assessments, so you had poor communities and communities that that was basically public housing. They had to take an additional load for industry versus you had like white communities and 
white communities. And, and Michigan is unfortunately like one of these highly segregated places. And uh, according to the US Census, like the city of Flint where I live in, Genesee County is the most racially segregated county in the nation. The metro Detroit area is the most set racially segregated metropolitan area in the nation. And then um, there is a twin city, Benton Harbor and St. Joseph, which is the most racially segregated twin city in the nation. And like when you think about like how things came to be, like having an actual critical analysis of how things came to be, you look at zoning, you look at notions of white supremacy. Oh, like, oh, those people kind of like deserve it. Like they, they, they're okay because they're tougher than us. Or like they like we want to make sure that we have clean air like nobody else deserves like everybody deserves clean air. Everybody deserves safe drinking water. Everybody deserves not to have toxic chemicals in their soil. So like when you start thinking more of a collective versus individualizing it or othering stuff like, oh, we want to be okay, but we don't care about the others. Like that's how you end up with this, um, like these schisms. And wh what we really need to like attack is like why are why why are these regulations the regulations basically permissible for industries? It's not really like for our protection. It's basically limiting the amount of chemicals. That are that are being spewed out in the air or in the soil or in the water, like we need to like really have uh, re to revamp like this analysis and, and really like build policies on based on what we want instead of like letting other like industries or, or other individuals um, defining what we want. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, so there's a, a lot of people in the room, uh, I can spot uh, some of them, <laughs> that are from the sustainability office. And um, now we want to talk a little bit about the environmental movement um, as a whole. And when we think about the triple um, bottom line, you have thinking about um, economics, right? And then the environment, and you have like the social. <laughs> and um, when we also talk about the, the social, it seems like a homogeneous um, social. So I'm, I'm wondering, like, what uh, does the environmental movement uh, uh, need? What is the, the shift that needs to happen there? And also how we make um, some communities that are invisible um, visible in, in that um, environmental movement? I mean, I'm sure both of us have our experience with big greens. Um, you know, you're kind of working within, just like so many systems, unfortunately, you're working within this kind of top-down organizing structure, top-down funding structure, um, and it can leave the communities most impacted just not even at the table. Like, you are a talking point that someone else paints a picture of. Um, you are part of a brochure that they're sending out to their funders when you're not actually part of the conversation, the decision making, the organizing, what the approach is, the messaging, none of it. Um, and I think it's, we're, at least I'm, I, I have seen some organizations making better change and, and doing more work to try to make sure that impacted communities are actually brought in, um, that we have a stake in this, that we have a voice in this. Um, I, I still see a lot of the same tactics, unfortunately, of tokenizing, which is really unfortunate. Um, but I do see a movement of, particularly with young people, that this is our environment and this is, it's like climate change is happening. It's not just something that's out in the future. It's not something that's 20, 30, 40 years. It's happening right now. You know, there are communities around the world that are experiencing this right now. The first climate change refugees in, are in the United States, are in the United States, are indigenous peoples being pushed off their homelands in Louisiana. These things are happening. And so, you know, with something like the Dakota Access Pipeline resistance, which was one of the most significant resistance movements in decades, it was led by indigenous people who have some of the lowest wealth communities you can possibly imagine. You know, we, we have such a lack of, you know, visibility and, and even basic acknowledgement. You know, like I was in Washington, D.C. and hearing questions like, 
oh my God, do you like live in a teepee or something? And I'm like, yeah, my teepee has Wi-Fi. Like, <laughs> what, what are you saying? Like, are you serious? You know, or questions like, oh wow, you guys go to law school now. And I'm like, yeah, like we go to law school and everything. It's amazing what happens when you're part of society that we're all living in. Like, okay. Um, you know, but you're, you're in this situation where you're fighting against all those things. But with, with that particular resistance movement, it was we were controlling the narrative. You know, indigenous people were controlling what was happening. Like, this is our story and we're going to tell it. And now millions of people around the world are listening to it. You know, it resonates them, the story of water, the story of, you know, a, a people being oppressed by the state, a people who have been forgotten for a long time, um, still dealing with the same issues, still not having their treaty rights upheld, still, you know, in these desperate conditions. Um, and that kind of forced, I think, a lot of the big green movement to be like, oh, I guess you guys maybe know how to do some of these things, huh? You know, like, I guess you guys maybe have a handle on how to protect the environment. Um, you know, that's a, that's a fascinating thing, being an indigenous person and a NGO being surprised that environmental stewardship is something that Native Americans understand. I'm just like, okay, so pretty sure everything was, you know, that Native people know how to, like, maintain their own resources and their own land structures. I, I don't think that we were causing buffalo to be extinct you know, or doing those things. We were practicing sustainability for a long time. It's written into our cultural structures, um, you know, but it's, it's a growing process. And I think it's one that's getting there. It's starting to get there. Um, I think as things become more urgent, I'm hopeful that more people recognize just how important it is um, to have impacted communities at the table. Well, wow. A lot of stuff was going through my head, like as you were talking, like as the question was happening, and I think I'm gonna relate a couple of quick random things that was popping in my head. So um, the first thing, like with the big greens and the Flint water crisis, they were extremely late to the party. They didn't come until after, um, even though like a lot of people reached out to them, I reached out to them. So after it became international news because even because there's, there, there's different definitions of what environmental stewardship is and what, what um, environment protection is, because we were like, the water coming out of our tap is toxic. But the Big Green's definition was more on the lines of primitivism, like we want to make sure, we just care about like lakes and streams and rivers. Like we don't really care about the waters coming out your tap. Like we care more, we like we want more people to go camping. I'm like, I don't even know no black people to own a tent. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there's black people out there and own a tent, but it's, but like going to, <laughs> but like when you have like um, there, there's been a real lack, and I mean like a lot of top down organizations, and especially like NGOs who are just like oh that 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 are supposed to be around, um, like, uh, gosh, the word is, like, escaping me, but I'll just kind of explain it, <laughs> that, like, groups that, that are, are supposed to be, that were formed to address social issues, like, you have kind of, like, this divorcing of, of narrative where you have um, folks who are trying to tell you what your experience is instead of, like, is being centered in your own experience. So uh, my challenge to like big environmental groups instead of like coming to poor black communities and talk about camping, like I, I don't really care about going out and camping. Like I have asthma, like I, I have allergies, like I don't want to be outside. I don't really like outside. Um, but really like talking to people like where, where they at because where, where I'm from, like, like we have parks and there, there are no basketball hoops. So like, start there. Or you have folks that's doing sustenance fishing and it's like you wanna talk about like how people, like you wanna like basically like do kayaking on the river. I'm like, no, there's people, they're, they're fishing on that river because they have to eat. Like they're supplementing like their diet with this fish. So start with that and, and really like um, beginning with how people are experiencing stuff instead of like um, proselytizing to them like this is like you could only you could only interact with us in this way because that is 
for me, like a huge turnoff. Um, so I think that we have heard about, generally, about the, the, your struggles, right, um, in the projects that you have been working on. Um, but I wanted to learn more about what are you doing right now in terms of, like, advocacy and policy. So what, what do you hope to see? What, what would be just? Or maybe before we can discuss what would be just, and what would you like to see? Uh, we can also talk about um, current situations of injustice. So let's divide this like in maybe three part questions. So um, current situations of injustice, what justice would look like, and um, l let's add what we can do, like how we can um, advocate and um, just, just be part of, of what you're doing and, and this movement. Uh, so currently, uh, my organization, Honor the Earth, is engaged in a years-long struggle against a tar sands line called Line 3. It's an Enbridge pipeline. It's their single largest project in company history. Um, it wants to send 900,000 barrels a day of tar sands through the headwaters of the Mississippi River to the shore of Lake Superior, the fifth of the world's freshwater. Um, and it wants to put, these, put this through Indian country, of course, uh, through treaty territory. Uh, through wild rice beds, which are at the heart of my people's culture. Um, so we are engaged in a, like I said, a, a big court, full court press um, in the regulatory process. We, we actually sued the company and forced them to do an environmental impact statement in the courts. Um, that process is ongoing, and meanwhile we're building camps along the pipeline route. Um, we recognize that we are in a time where something even like a Canadian corporation has more rights than some of the citizens that are in this country that are part of the state, that are indigenous people that are actually indigenous to the lands on which these companies want to send their projects through. Um, so definitely very engaged in that. It's very cold in Minnesota. <laughs> um, living outside can be very difficult. Um, but I've also been heavily, heavily engaged in the divestment push that's been happening that really kind of gained a lot of momentum um, during Standing Rock and after Standing Rock. Uh, so after the ground resistance was over, people were like, what can I do? How can I help? And it was go to the banks, take your money out of the bank, go to your city council, have your city council take their money out of these banks that are funding these projects. Um, and that's been really effective. Um, over the course of the last year, I've been to Europe a number of times and have met directly with these banks. Um, we've had divestments happen again and again to the tune of, I mean, we're at almost in just local domestic divestment, almost $5 billion, and then abroad, I mean, we've had entire banks pull out of the fossil fuel industry. You know, that's amazing systems change. Uh, one, of the, one of the organizations, or one of the places that we met with was the Norwegian Oil Fund. It's the second largest funder of fossil fuels in the world, a trillion dollar portfolio. I mean, these guys are living a great life in Norway, but they're living it off of the uh, destruction of environment elsewhere. And um, we met with them twice. And initially their, their response was, we're going we're gonna to reevaluate the Dakota Access Pipeline project and determine whether it meets our ethical standards. We targeted Norway specifically because they are bound by UN principles, like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, like the Human Rights Convention. Their country actually signed on to these, these, these and bound themselves to them, unlike the United States. Um, and so they initially said, we're going to think about this, and then out of a very surprised move, they announced that they're actually going to be looking at and reevaluating their investment into fossil fuels, period. Um, the entire European market dropped for a day when they said that because they are such a big player in the fossil fuel industry. Um, so if there's a way to get involved, that is definitely a great way to get involved. Um, figuring out what your university is invested in, figuring out what your city is invested in, figuring out what you're personally invested in. Um, they don't listen to morality, but they do listen to money. Um, and if I were to say, you know, how to achieve justice, I think that's a huge question. <laughs> um, I think at this, it, it almost seems like we're in a period of trying to preserve what, what we have um, because of the administration that's in place, because of the assault that we're seeing on citizens' rights in favor of corporate interests. Um, you know, I, I think it's important that we recognize the power of people and each other. Um, you know, this protesting and activists and all these people, these are the people costing these companies literally billions of dollars because they're standing together, because they're concerned, because this is, this is our future that's on the line. It's our children's future on the line. 
Um, and it's incredible what we can do when we stand together. You know, I mean, it, I watched a little camp of 12 people grow into 10,000 people. We were the 13th largest city in North Dakota at one point. That's pretty amazing, right? <laughs> and as much as they hated us, I mean, like Shields and all the like, you know, in, all the outdoor gear places loved us. We camped a lot, obviously. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I think you know, as as organizers, another I would have one more comment, and this is something that I, I hope that the green movement can figure out and, and move forward in a better way on, which is we're in this, we're engaged in this struggle in Minnesota, right? I mean, this is an all-out war for our culture. You know, if tar sands gets into wild rice and destroys, it's a destruction of culture that's been around for, for thousands and thousands of years, since before the United States. Um, and, you know, these people are, you know, all these indigenous people are showing up at these hearings, these public hearings, and we're angry, you know. Some of these people are very upset. They're, they're moved to tears. They're very, very, very upset with the process with being shut out of the process, with Enbridge, you know, pushing all of all of these people out and the judge, you know, in, the, in this situation, looking or appearing like they were favoring the corporation. And the Big Green's response was, I don't know who all these, you know, I mean, maybe you could talk to them. You know, these, these Indians are really angry. I mean, they're kind of like, maybe we could paint them as outside agitators. And I'm like, are you... Are you seriously asking me as an indigenous person to paint other indigenous people as outside agitators? I'm pretty sure if anyone's more inside than anyone else, it would be the people that are originally from these places. Um, so that would be a strong thing is just you know, being conscious of yourself and, and, the, and the space you hold when you walk into organizing spaces and recognizing other people's space too and where they're at you know, and, and meeting them where they're at you know, and not, not expecting some kind of behavior that meets whatever criteria you personally are comfortable with um, and whatever you personally think because everyone's coming at this from a different perspective and a different set of experiences and sometimes intergenerational experiences of trauma and abuse that have happened. Um, so that's why I hope we can move towards at least, at least a more civil situation for all of us or more understanding. So um, right now we're still living our lives with bottled water. Um, we have many people who are still struggling with like long-term health issues and emotional trauma. Um, emotional trauma from um, repeated miscarriages, uh, from just seeing their kids act different, the uncertainty of like long-term um, what's going to happen to like their families and their homes. And even though like all the cameras went away, um, the struggle never went away. And the everyday experiences that people are facing in Flint are the same that it was um, three years ago. So um, what Flint Rising um, and what I'm working on is uh, we have a set of, of bills in the state legislature called the Water to Human Right Bill Package that um, we're trying to make water public trust and uh, addressing some of the policies that um, contributed to the, the Flint water crisis. And I would say like on a national stage, um, we have a coalition called the Coalition for Lead Free Water and um, we're at some point in time, hopefully, a new draft of the lead and copper rule will come out and um, there will be some points for people to, to weigh in on that. But one of the other like hard lessons that we learned from the water crisis is um, there is no national standard for cooking or bathing water. So it's stuff for drinking water, but not like any other type of water. And the other lesson that we learned from the water crisis is Flint never received um, a disaster declaration. We only received a declaration of emergency because the Stafford Act does not like give you the right, give the federal government the right to declare a disaster declaration based on 
man-made. It was a man-made disaster. Well, it was a theft of democracy. Like that was the <laughs> that was the disaster. We had a hurricane, fascism that swirled over the state of Michigan, and we had uh, <laughs> uh, we had the water crisis. So those are some things that we are, have been fighting against, but there there have been like a there there's so many lawsuits, like it's not even funny. There's criminal lawsuits, there's uh civil lawsuits. But that stuff is going to take time for the dust to settle on all of those class action lawsuits. And you have people who are suffering right now. And before we had a water quality crisis where we had a, you know, like all this lead in our water we had a water cost crisis. So water is, is like the cost of water is rising and you're gonna have more and more communities that will be unable to afford water. So I'm sure that all of you have questions and we are going to try um, this um, engagement um, technique, which is, um, to use your phone, like go to this website and enter the code, which is um, sli.do, and just post a comment. And if you like a comment that somebody else is, um, that somebody else posted, um, you just have to stare it, um, and then that way um, it will take, or will have a, a priority. So let's like just take a, a few a few minutes. Oh, there's questions already. Okay. Oh. Wow. Ah. So modern. I think I need some help. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll just hold up here. <laughs> oh no, we're losing all the middle schoolers. Bye guys, thanks for coming. Oh. All right, so let's see if I can figure this out. Seems like at the top we have uh, a question that receives 32 uh, thumbs up, and you cannot see this. Um, and um, like Najira went for a little break, but we have like Tara. And the question is like, what are effective ways we can help in environmental crises such as Flint or Dakota Access? when we are not um, local. Right. And I'm going to give a shout out to all the middle schoolers who are, who are leaving right now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, thank Very you for coming. <laughs> so I think it's important to acknowledge uh, our youth. The youth are doing such amazing things. I mean, we've got youth lawsuits that are happening where they're suing the federal government for their right to live. I mean, that's incredible, watching youth, 13-year-olds, 12-year-olds. I mean, these guys are amazing. I was definitely not doing that when I was 12 and 13. <laughs> so. um, yeah, no, that was a question I got all the time at Dakota Access. I'm sure it's a question that she got all the time when, you know, the Flint crisis was really in the news, is how can I help? I'm not, I can't get to, you know, uh, Bismarck, North Dakota. I can't get to Cannonball, North Dakota. Uh, what can I do? And honestly, I, I will say too, there was a lot of people that came and didn't know what to do when they were there either. And they ended up kind of just hanging out and taking some cool selfies and then going back home. And that really isn't the most effective you know, way to help. Um, but then there were other people who showed up and just chopped wood for a weekend and that was super helpful. Or people who were willing to go out and onto the front lines and try to you know, stop construction for a day. That was amazing. Um, you know, if you can't actually physically get there, I think that was, you know, that's the beauty of something like divestment, is it's anywhere, right? It's, it's in any community, it's in anyone's hands to do these things. You know, the, the city of, uh, you know, Seattle was one of the first ones to divest from Wells Fargo. 
And that was just some people showing up at the council me- city council meetings that like, you know, very few people actually go to um, and engaging and saying, you know, I'm not cool with this. I'm not okay with the fact that my city council and my city money is invested into this project. And that turned into them pulling out $4 billion from Wells Fargo. You know, and that eventually ended up after hundreds of protests of shutting down branches of Wells Fargo around the country, they finally called and said, we'd love to have a meeting with you, you know? And I was like, oh, you guys are our friends now. We've been trying to have meetings with you for a long time. Um, so that, that kind of work is certainly something you can do. You know, you can support the struggle for sure. You know, I'm sure she has a website, I have a website, you know, things like that, supporting a, a struggle f- from afar. Um, But also looking at your own localities, I mean, this is like bear's ears, right? I mean, that's happening. Like, that is a real situation, and it's a federal situation, too, which is even more scary. You know, our fight in Minnesota, we're struggling to keep it in Minnesota courts. Trump is already trying to assess whether or not FERC can step in in that situation. It's an entirely state decision, but they want that. He wants that pipe. Those are his friends, right? You know, so like his fellow cronies. Um, and so we're in a state situation, but over here, you guys are in the federal. I mean, that's, that's terrifying, and that's everyone's culture and history lost. It's not just the indigenous people. It is the culture and history of, of this country, too. So um, I'm sure there's plenty of struggles you can support locally as well. Yeah. Um, Nayira, now that you're back, the question was, <laughs> uh, what are effective ways we can help in environmental crisis, um, such as Flint, when we are not local? Yeah, well, we have a website, flintrising.com. Uh, but first of all, I'll say guard your own water systems, your own municipal water systems. Really look at your own water quality report. Get your water tested. Know, um, like, your state environmental regulatory agency. Like, look at the threshold levels because, um, like, the lead and copper rule is like 15 parts per billion. But state laws could always go above and beyond. They can be a lot more stricter um, than any federal regulation. So that can be something like for your state or like for your own um, municipal water system. Look at like how soon your communities can be notified. Because one of the things that we were able to pass, the only bill that we're able to pass in the Water and Human Rights Bill package is that um, if your water's over a threshold level, they have to give you like a 72 hour notice to to notify instead of like a year. So <laughs> like we were, we were in violation of the Safe Drinking Water Act and it took them uh, nine months for them to even notify us. And this was like after we were being exposed to total trihalomethase, which is a chlorination byproduct that is like six times more deadly when you're taking your nice hot showers or you're soaking in your hot tub than it is than if you drink it. And I might add um, up to this um, answer, because a lot of people ask me about Puerto Rico, what you can do, and I think that I always like narrow it down to like just three things. So one of them is like donate, right? Um, so you have like here two organizations that you can um, donate and um, just uh, stay involved, like coming to events like this, getting in social media, um, receiving newsletters from organizations. And um, the, the third one will be like call your representatives, right? Um, and, and do your due diligence. Um, all right, so the, another question is like, why do we forget that native peoples are also people of color and important stakeholders? How can we better identify common interests of all people of color? Um, You know, I think when it comes to the erasure of Native people, it starts at a very young age. I mean, I I grew up in the same history textbooks as many, many people, and it was a, you know, maybe a page and a half about the hunter and gatherers. Apparently, I'm a hunter-gatherer, had no idea. Um, You know, and then Sitting Bull died, and then it was really sad, but then Manifest Destiny happened, and that was great, you know, and we're really sad about that. You know, and then you're sitting in a classroom and all your fellow students are looking at you like, why are you still here? It doesn't really make sense. And I'm like, I know, right? Um, (laughs) You know, we're kind of in this, we are so erased from so much of the narrative. And it's kind of this painful shame that uh, that the United States will just still is not willing to recognize or acknowledge. 
Um, you know, I think even Canada has made some strides towards you know, reconciliation, truth and reconciliation of the residential school era. Um, over in the U.S., there's only four states that even acknowledge boarding schools in their textbooks. Um, you know, 87% of references in textbooks are pre-1900s. That's our children's textbooks, what they're reading. Um, more than half of U.S. states don't even mention more than a single tribe. They just talk about the Iroquois nation. Um, and you're not learning about Indian child welfare at all. You know, you're not learning about where we're at today. You're not learning about the youths who are here, all the, all the indigenous people of the area who are still here. Um, you know, I think that something like Washington State, which has made it mandatory to include modern curriculum of modern native people in their children's, in their children's education is, is systems change. You know, they're learning from a very young age. These are treaty rights. These are people who are still here. This is what happened to them. This is why they're in some of the positions that they're in. You know, everyone wonders, why are you so poor? Well, you know, it's kind of hard when your entire land source and your resources are controlled by the federal government, that everything you do requires some federal action, and you have to ask permission to use your own resources. And then you're also sitting there in a situation where, okay, so this is the treaty rights that we agreed to. We signed these treaties with the United States of America, um, have never been fulfilled, have been repeatedly broken again and again and again. And it's not like, a, oh, that happened so long ago, get over it. It's, well, the Constitution happened a long time ago, but we still follow that, right? So I think it's, with something like that of, you know, forgetting that we're people of color and that we're still here, it's, I think it's important that we're all inclusive when we're, when we're working towards change, towards systems change. And I've seen that happening throughout movements where you see all these different communities like the immigration movement and the environmental movement and women's rights and you know um, LGBTQ, like all these people standing together because it is powerful when people stand together. And it's particularly becoming this, this weird kind of like, you know, unlikely bedfellows is what I've heard it referred to as, where you're sitting next to someone who's a union worker, but they're losing their job and they're in almost the same boat. They're like, this isn't fair. And, uh, and I'm like, yeah, that's, that's called oligarchy and corporations and all those things. It's impacting you now too. Um, so I think we have to do a really good job within the movement to always remember to include mm -hmm. every voice and make sure that we're, we're doing our best to really seek change and truth. The labor movement, like, they funded the civil rights movement. And after the civil rights movement, you had the American Indian movement that was inspired by the civil rights movement. And you had the, um, the, the gay rights movement that was inspired by the civil rights movement. So, and now you have, then you had like Occupy and, and now you have like what's happening at Standing Rock and you have a whole generation of people who are now inspired by what happened in Occupy and now what's happening at Standing Rock. But I think, you know, like we have to remember that all our struggles are connected like we cannot have this system of oppression Olympics where it's like, well, my oppression is better or more important than your oppression and me because I know like I'm going to mangle this thing for Audre Lorde. It's like, well, when I come out, like am I gay or am I a woman or am I black? Like you're, you're all of that. Like it's intersectionality. Like I'm Muslim. I'm black. I'm an American citizen. I'm asexual. Like I'm all of it. Like I don't like partition myself. And I think that we have to, like, as people who are hold privilege and people who do not hold privilege, like, you need to start looking at yourself as part of the collective, like, you're all of it, and realize that our struggles are connected. And, like, yeah, you may have privilege in some ways, but you may not have privilege in other ways. It's like, I don't have privilege a whole lot of ways, but I, my, I, this is going to be kind of crass. My mom's vagina was in the United States, and that's how I became a U.S. citizen. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, and so I, I'm a U.S. citizen. So I, I know that I hold privilege in that. I hold privilege in citizenship. So, like, when it comes to, like, immigrant rights, I need to say I'm not going to be taking up all the space because I don't, that's not my experience. I'm going to sit back and I'm going to wait and t like when people who are living those experiences tell me what to do, I'm just going to do it. And don't ask questions. Just like when we are in um, Black Lives Matter spaces and it's like we tell white people what to do, they shouldn't be asking no questions. They should just trust us because that's our experience.
Thank you. So I'm going to ask um, two questions together. Uh, Utah politicians have tried to discredit indigenous people who supported the creation of Bears Ears National Monument by saying that Big Green is really behind the monument designation. How is this viewed within the Native American community? So that's one question, but I'm going to add another question. Um, politicians often say that environmental deregulation will promote jobs. What is the proper balance between jobs and environmental impacts? Um, how do you teach this balance politically? Yeah, so um, I'm actually, right after I leave here, I'm going to be heading out to Denver to meet with the Greenpeace attorneys who are fighting the Energy Transfer Partnership lawsuit where they allege that all the big greens that were involved in Standing Rock actually lied to the tribe and used us to forward their evil, evil agenda of protecting the environment. Um, that they were involved in a, in a racketeering scheme. So they, they filed this, it's called a slap suit, uh, strategic lawsuit against pr public participation. Um, so, you know, those tactics of painting um, this in some way as big greens lying to tribes and using us for their own agenda, I mean, that is, first of all, total bullshit. You know what I mean? Like in a lot of situations, like particularly something like that, that is a sacred site. It's been sacred to those people since time immemorial. You know what I mean? You're talking about something that, it, that predates the United States. I'm pretty sure that tribal nations know what's sacred and what's not. You know, that they understand their own history and their own culture better than a big green does. You know, it just happens that sometimes these movements intersect, right? Like, I, I, like, they, like she was saying, they're, they're all intersectional, right? Like, yes, okay, maybe when you look at that, you see a beautiful lake, a beautiful stream, you know, something that you want to protect because you like camping outside. You know, my people, when I look at that, I see like a, a place that my grandparents and my great grandparents and their great grandparents, you know, that's where my people have been for literally hundreds of generations. You know, that means something different to me. And to you, it means a source of drinking water. You know, maybe that's your perspective. It's, it's this is my drinking water that's coming out of the tap. You know, um, to try to discount that in some way as this big green agenda is, I think that's just a political move to try to justify the delisting of a, of a place that's sacred to more than just one people and important to more than just one people um, as some kind of, you know, big move, which is, you look at something like that and you're like, you know, so what's the evil agenda here? Protecting the environment? Like, okay. Um, and then the second part of your question was... Um, so it's like politicians often say that environmental deregulation will promote jobs. Oh. So what is the proper, appropriate um, balance between jobs and environmental impacts? And how do you teach this balance politically? Yeah, uh, the jobs question. You know, that's usually the biggest pushback that's for politicians when we meet with them and we say something like, you know, I don't want a pipeline going through my, my people's treaty territory. They say something like, well, the unions are very much for this project because they need jobs. They need construction jobs. They need blue collar jobs. Um, you know. I, a big part of what uh, Honor the Earth and Honor the Earth does is engage in uh, transition, just transition also. So, uh, you know, my, my response to that is, okay, well, with almost no money and training ourselves and bringing in other people, we've been able to f successfully create a solar panel manufacturing facility on a reservation in the middle of nowhere, and now we've got six full-time jobs like, created out of that and now that community is empowering itself and doing and engaging in self-determination of that community by producing their own energy, you know, while creating jobs. So to your jobs comment, why is your state not investing in, you know, green energy? Why are we not moving this economy towards a green energy economy? Instead investing in an entrenched fossil fuel industry, you know, 10,000% growth over the last 10 years alone in solar. Um, and then we look at wind, which is rapidly increasing. Um, you know, you, you talk to a, a corporation like Enbridge and they say, well, we're, we're investing in green energy. And I'm like, okay, well, you're investing 5% of your portfolio in it. You are engaged in the fossil fuel industry. That's what makes you money. You know, you have to make a conscious decision to actually move towards green economy. So there are jobs that are available that don't destroy the planet and don't destroy those workers' grandchildren's futures. I'll just answer the second question. And, um, like, I come from a labor family. Like my dad, UAW retiree, my mom, she's a nurse, but she's a teamster. <laughs> and um, there, I mean, for me, like that, that's always been like a false narrative 
where you're trying to pit like labor against mm -hmm. like the in like environmental movement and my response is all jobs ain't good jobs so like yes we all want jobs where we can raise our family and um that we can go on vacation and pay for our children's um, college education but there, there are things that are more important than just a paycheck right now. Like you need to, to make sure that when you talk about sustainability, it's not just, we don't wanna be like the large corporations right now. It's like, we're just gonna extract, 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 and we don't give a damn on what's gonna happen like 50 years from now. Because like we've, we've lived that life, um, like, through the industrial revolution and it wasn't it wasn't all that great. Just like we we had like the United States built off of the exploitation of black bodies and wasn't that great. <laughs> like, so we need to make sure that like when we look towards the future, like we're better than that narrative. We need to look um, to what's gonna happen like generations from now that we can guard like this planet because like me like I'm a sci-fi fanatic and I'm like all the rich white people are going to like leave the planet and they're going to like be on spaceships like after they destroy this planet so we got to make sure that um, <laughs> we got to make sure that this planet is good for like all the all, all, all the people right now Prison is already big, so they're, oh they're yeah working. like they're gonna they're gonna go like live on Mars on the moon or something <laughs> Oh, here we have a great question from Kathy. Segregation and environmental racism are rampant. What about Flint and Dakota Access Pipeline made it national news? And what organizing strategies were key? Um, I think the, for us, we started becoming national news when all of these Facebook live streams of native people putting themselves in front of machines was a very powerful narrative. Um, and seeing people, you know, praying peacefully um, and being assaulted by police officers w was what grasped their attention. Um, it was unfortunate in some ways because it, it kind of created the situation where a lot of people kind of came out to watch Indian Pain, um, where you were out and in this situation trying to protect something and then you look back behind you and there's like a thousand people all holding up their cell phones watching you. And you're like, maybe come help and don't do that. Um, but when it first really got going, I think it was that powerful narrative of, of indigenous people, citizens versus this kind of corporate state. And that carried with a lot of people. It meant a lot to a lot of people and it got shared around the world um, on social media to the point that Obama got questioned in Laos by a student about the Dakota Access Pipeline, he had no idea what was going on. Um, and it then became something that all of a sudden CNN was showing up and New York Times and all these people were showing up in, in Bismarck, North Dakota and in Cannonball, North Dakota. Um, and there were no rental cars and it was very, very difficult to get around. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, I think it, it went from that and successful organizing strategies were one of the more powerful elements, I think, was the coming together of hundreds of indigenous nations. So all these nations signed resolutions. They came out to Standing Rock and had these beautiful ceremonies and shared culture and experience with one another. But then there were also all of these non-native folks who came too. It was allies from every possible social justice movement, environmental movement, um, you know, just different struggles around the world. We had people from Palestine there. I mean, it was this huge conglomeration of people that were standing up for justice and really acting in solidarity with each other. And there were definitely some growing pains along the way, but that was a really successful, I think, strategy with outreach um, to all these organizations and trying to find housing for them when they showed up so they could have a nice tent to stay in. Oh, um, I stayed in one of the yurts. Yeah, oh, you stayed in a yurt. Yurts were, yurts were like at the top. Yurts were at the top. There's like, if you're outside living, like, like the summer tents are down here, yurts are like way up here. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and you know, making sure I think a lesson from it, one strategy that was effective, but definitely a lesson is uh, nonviolent direct action was something that kept that narrative going and really made it grow and also actively delayed construction and cost the company hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, I think moving forward, it's important to 
educate everyone involved about what NVDA really means and what it's about. It's not about violence, it's about nonviolence and, and taking a stand and putting your freedom at risk for a better cause, a larger cause. Um, that was effective and so is, I think, the, the strategy of remaining peaceful and remaining uh, you know, based in prayer the, the entire time. It was very, very important to, I think, the narrative to see people getting, I mean, just brutalized and still praying, you know. That was, it was a really beautiful but difficult thing and it carried a message, I think, throughout the world. Mm -hmm. uh, for Flint, I will say that there's two different arcs. There's the arc that, um, the arc, I will say, like, from the switch to the Flint River to we had acknowledgement from the governor and then the second arc, which is, um, after the emergency declarations, when it became international news, um, like till today. So, like for the first arc, um, because it was a very small um, coalition, and and I would say like building a coalition, we had a multi-generational, multi-racial um, coalition made up of groups that became some of them became activated because of individuals and groups that became activated because of the quality of water that was coming from their tap. And then you like, so like the group that was, I co-founded, which was the Flint Democracy Defense League, we actually formed to confront the emergency manager law. And we got pulled into the, the fight for clean water because it was an action of the emergency manager. So we were, anything the emergency manager did like we confronted them, like the emergency manager like sold off our Santa Claus, we raised money to buy it back. Um, <laughs> like the emergency manager, um, so we had like a lot of creative direct actions. So we would do like die-ins and like tape, put tape over our mouths and do like silent protests and just do like a bunch of creative stuff. Uh, we like block the race. <laughs> we have a crim race and we like blocked it, we did a blockade. Um, and then, like, we had a coalition of clergy called the Concerned Pastors for Social Action, and they were kind of more, kind of like the grass tops, like, we want to meet with the governor, we want to meet the governor's people, and I so. And then, like, you had, like, what are you fighting for, which was, like, a group that basically became active because of the switch. And, like, with that, like, we, we did, like, all the traditional organizing stuff. So we had meetings, we did some actions, we did a lot of education, trying to pull people into the movement, because we had to fight the narrative that was um, from the state and our local government that the water was safe to drink. And um, after one of the women, Leanne Walters, had um, water that was basically um, two and a half times the level of toxic waste coming out of her tap, so she had 13,500 parts per billion, and um, at the federal level, 5,000 parts per billion for lead is toxic waste. Um, so after that, she connected with Miguel Del Toro, which, um, which works with the EPA. He, he was an um, expert on the lead and copper rule. He actually tested her water. He got gaslighted by the EPA and like, gave her, like, leaked his own memo to the ACLU and the Michigan ACLU and connected us with Mark Edwards, who is a civil engineer professor at Virginia Tech. And we did our own independent water testing because before we were like, we just want the truth. And very naively, we thought that once we had the truth, then the state's going to go along and acknowledge the truth. But that wasn't the case. The state was like, no, nah, we don't care what you got. Like, we're just not going to believe it because like we got our own stuff going on. And we had, um, Dr. Mona Hanatisha, who's a pediatrician, who looked at the um, looked at the blood lead levels of newborns, and that, that's stuff that has to be reported to the federal government. Because if you're poor and I'm a public assistant, they have to take your blood and report it to the federal government. Um, so coincidentally, like they they mapped that out on top of like the map that Mark Edwards did, and that was. Um, and Dr. Mona and Tisha was like, yes, this coincides with the switch to the Flint River. The state's response was, no, nah, you just don't know how to read your data. Because there's also this veneer, this undergirding of misogyny because, it, because all the activists were women. They were like, oh, we're bored housewives. I ain't even married, but um, we're bored housewives. 
like you're just being hysterical. So it was like all these narratives by the um, by state officials. And after um, it was like collaborated by um, the Detroit Free Press that yes, this coincides with the switch to the Flint River, then we got an acknowledgement. And I'll say like very briefly the arc after it became international news, like we were inundated by like by rando people who were coming in. Um, we had like tons of news media, we had rando people who would come in. It's like, well, we have the one, like we just want to be the one um, savior for the whole city of Flint. And like, we don't want to like listen to your narrative or center. Um, with your own experiences. So um, really like that's how like Flint Rising came to be was because we were like, we got to guard our community from these sharks. Cause we had like people who were affiliated with like attorneys that were like knocking door to door trying to sign up people yeah. to like, to like lawsuits. And we had a lot of people who are just like, they were not part of the activists cause it was only like probably about a hundred of us total. Really strong was 20. So like out of a population of 100,000 people, like you had like people were just like living their life, and now it's like, oh no, like now we gotta deal with all the systems, and people are just trying to like pull us every which way, and we don't really know what to do, and um, so like really like that's how Flint Rising happened. So you had like all these celebrities come in, and just like all these, just it was just like craziness because it was like Flint just got discovered. But we were facing this and fighting this for like a year and a half. So um, on the positive part, like we were kind of able to kind of build like um, coalition because we didn't have the national spotlight. Like we didn't have any spotlight at all because we had a media blackout. Um, so we we're able to kind of like build like coalition. But I would say the disadvantage for us is like we never, like our coalition was for us to get a clean source of water. Like we didn't think beyond that. And um, cause we were like, oh, well now we have a clean source of water. We didn't ask that question, well, what's, what's next? Like what, now what? Like what do we want next? And um, unfortunately like that coalition that I had described, um, we kind of all fell apart. Even though we still kind of collaborate but we were not, we're not like what we were before. Okay. We have like five minutes. We're going to do some closing statements in the form of a, of a question. So uh, what message do you hope our students and young, young folks uh, walk away with today? Um, I really hope that, you know, especially the little kids, but everyone else too. Um, I hope that people realize that it's, not as hard as you think to get engaged and to make a change. Um, you know, you can start small and you can end up changing something that influences an entire industry. You know, if you just, if you just engage and do something. Um, it's so hard for people to get up and actually do something. Sharing messages on social media is not enough. I'm going to say that right now. You know, sharing that Twitter story or sharing that, like, now this story is not enough. Like, yeah, that's important. Definitely do that. You need to raise awareness. Um, but changing your Facebook profile picture and whatever, you know, that's, that's not enough. Um, it's, it's not going to create the systems change that we need. It's almost kind of like this light version of complacency, right? Where you're just kind of like, well, I care. I'm going to show everyone I care, but I'm not really actually going to do anything. Um, you know, and it doesn't have to be, I'm going to go lock myself to a piece of equipment or I'm going to go shut down a government office or whatever, you know, you don't have to necessarily go to that level right away, you know. Um, for those who actually do want to go to that level, please do, you know, like we need more people that are willing to do that. But I hope that people realize that there's lots of different roles to play, um, that it takes not just one angle, it's everything all together that can make a change. Um. I would say deputize yourself. Like you don't have to ask for permission to get in the movement. Um, so, social movements is a full contact sport, and you can't make change sitting on the sidelines. Um, because like with the with the Flint water crisis, it was like one of the women like she was a band promoter, 
Like, she wasn't in social justice. Like, she didn't know what social justice was. She was just, like, raising her family. Another woman, she, like, she was just, she was a military wife and, you know, taking care of her family and got pulled in to social justice. So you don't have to, like, wait until you graduate, wait till you get the right degree, wait till you got the suit and all that stuff to, like, jump into, um, into social justice or the social movements or any movement where you're making a change. Right before we go, I just want to give you a little bit of information. I'm sorry. Um, I get the great part of thanking very special people who helped made this happen. Um, Dean Bob Kiter in the law school, we thank you for our partnership uh, with the Office for Equity and Diversity. Um, also, uh, the Office of Equity and Diversity, we get lots of kudos for putting on really great events, but there's a team that really does a lot of heavy lifting in our office that Catherine and I rely on. They make us look fabulous all the time. That's Mindy Johnson, Estella Hernandez, and Neelam Chand. And I want to just give kudos that that team, they're so provocative, they decided this year to do a different format to allow more conversation, to allow more question and answer. And so I just wanted to just tip my hat off to our team and thank, thank you for that. To our guest and our panel, our, our, our adjudicator, I'm a music professor, sorry. Um, <laughs> and to our guest, I want to say thank you for coming, but in addition to that, I want to thank you for your work and activism. Um, I'm a daughter of an activist, um, born and raised in the South, North Carolina. My father was a student at North Carolina A&T State University, where the Greensboro sit-ins happened. Their student body president was Jesse Jackson at the time. And I was fortunate enough, I lost my father a few years ago because of environmental, he has uh, environmental um, toxic uh, exposure to Agent Orange back when he fought in Vietnam, and that's a whole different aspect of it. Um, but my, I had a fortunate opportunity to have my grandmother until just last year. And she said, I kept getting these letters that your dad wouldn't show up for class because he was out protesting and doing all those things. But because of his work as an activist, I am the first generation post Jim Crow. I am the first generation that does have, have access that his generation did not have. So the work must continue on. But we need to make sure that we remember that it is our activists that keep us moving forward and we still have a really, really long way to go. Lastly, I want to share with you um, that the conversation continues. So this was a conversation about environmental racism on a national level. Tomorrow, we're going to speak specifically about environmental, race, uh, environmental racism on a local level. We have PISA and politics sponsored by the Hinckley Institute tomorrow at 1215. So we're going to now bring this broader conversation into uh, a local conversation. And lastly, I have to recognize some young people. They're not students of ours. They're actually high school students. And these students have competed, uh, have turned in information about work, civil work that they have done, service work in their schools and in their communities. And we're getting ready to honor them now. A lot of people had to run to that banquet. But I would like to ask if our MLK Youth Leadership Award recipients are here. Can you please stand so we can just acknowledge you for all the work that you've had that you've done? Thank you. We thank each one of you for your work. We thank you for your service. We're grateful that you're doing the service that you do. And once again, thank you to our panelists for sharing your words of wisdom with us, the work that you've done. But most importantly, thank you for the work that you're doing. So thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. <laughs>